I get started? Yeah, so um, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, we'll probably wait a couple more minutes around 6.05 um, to start just in case anybody comes in uh, within the next couple of minutes. Um, but this should last about an hour uh, or so. It might go 10 or 15 minutes over, uh, but if anybody has time, uh, you can stay at the end for a quick Q&A session. Hi, Cindy. And if y'all have any um, like burning questions that you wanna answer throughout this workshop or for us to explore, feel free to type those in the notes or in the messages right now. And welcome Cindy and also welcome Mary. Hi, folks, for those who join. We have Dan and then also Elizabeth. Welcome. Paley, are you ready to start? Yeah, feel free to go. All right. Well, everybody, uh, welcome to uh, How to Cultivate a Captivating Workshop, uh, which is a collaboration this year. It's a new collaboration with Programming Committee for VO1 and Pele uh, Lay right here. Um, so yeah, we're going to go ahead and start with uh, some quick introductions. So uh, really quick, we're going to introduce ourselves, the facilitators. Uh, Pili, do you want to go to the next slide? Alrighty, so my name is Erica Nguyen. Um, this year I am programming director for this VO1 conference. And then Intel, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Erica. Hi, everybody. My name is Intel Pentago, and I am part of the programming committee for this upcoming VO1 conference. And then um, my name is Pele. Uh, and you see him pronouns. Um, I'll be supporting and presenting uh, on this workshop as well. I'm currently a board of directors for the UVSA Midwest region. Um, but uh, I used to be really, or I'm still involved, but I moved to Washington, D.C., which is why I may not be around as much. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so if we're gonna try to have everybody uh, pr uh, introduce themselves as well. If you wanna utilize the chat box and just type 
what is your name? Where are you from? And what do you want to learn from this webinar? And I can just read them out loud. Uh, it's on the slide, uh, y'all can read your screen, but it's what's your name, where are you from, and what do you want to learn from this webinar? Uh, welcome, Liz Nguyen from Chicago slash Cincinnati, and she hopes to learn how to best curate an impactful workshop. Awesome. And also feel free to interpret these questions however you like. Um, when we ask like where you're from, uh, maybe a more appropriate question or a uh, question we want to ask is like, where's home to you? Hi, Min Nguyen from Saigon, Vietnam, and he is excited uh, to learn how to lead. Welcome Tian Mai from Wisconsin, Madison, and she hopes how to learn on how to continuously maintain the interest of the audience. So here's Pong, he's from New York City and he wants to learn how uh, to be a better presenter. Awesome. Hi, this is Kipper Nguyen from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Kipper is excited to learn about presenting. Oh, Carolyn, I missed you. Um, let me see. Oh, so Carolyn Lowe from Iowa is here to support uh, her committee, which is programming, and learn more about what it what makes a workshop more meaningful to attendees. Also, Victoria Vu from Cincinnati, uh, but she just recently moved to New Jersey. Victoria hopes to learn more about how to keep your audience engaged. Nia E is from Tampa, Florida, and she wants to learn how to engage the audience. Tony Ngo is from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Hi, Tony, and he wants to know what a good workshop is so he can inform, so he can form a good presentation to engage the audience. Awesome. So I think that was mostly everybody. Uh, I think it's just Cindy left, but I don't know if. Uh, she's active in the chat box. We can continue. Alrighty, well, uh, thank you everybody again for introducing themselves. So uh, for the agenda, these are just the uh, key processes that we thought uh, make a workshop successful. So for this presentation, we're going to be going over how to cultivate your topic, the learning outcomes, engaging content, uh, how to make your workshop accessible, and then also how to create your description and title.
All right. Thank you, Erica. So before we begin, um, I just wanted to um, lay out some uh, community agreements we've made up. And um, just really quickly, um, and very briefly, we just wanted um, to make sure we all agreed that uh, uh, to be present, which means that um, while it's very hard for an online call, we are make sure we are there by gauging our curiosity because we're all here to learn together um, and how to cultivate and hopefully make a great workshop uh, and gain this knowledge. And also feel free um, or everyone to agree to ask any questions you may have in the chat box um, and we'll answer it diligently as much as we can. And um, if you're not speaking um, to help uh, make sure we block out any background noise and stuff like that and while we're recording is to meet you in the mic if you're not talking. And um, just in general, have fun. So, but um, before we move on, um, just want to say once again, those are the community agreements we set up. And um, if any of you guys want to add anything, just please feel free to text or say it so we can add it on to it. Yeah, so um, as Erica was saying on our agenda, uh, we would like to first uh, start off with the metaphor of planting seeds and how to cultivate um, topics for a workshop. So we, uh, as a, me, Erica, and Pele were talking about it, we decided to um, create an acronym and a process on how to do that. And that is, uh, we came up with SAP, which is Strength, Audience, and Possibility. And we provided a nice picture of a tree with SAP for you guys. So the first step um, with the S is uh, strength, and that's mostly in the process of identifying your strengths. So um, a common question would be like, what do you know more than most people? So, and it can be anything particular um, that you want to gauge with your audience when developing this workshop, whether it be if you want to gauge workshop and say, I know how to I, know the ten, I want to be able to teach people to do some maybe like 15 second choreography in maybe hip hop or busking or something like that. Or maybe um, you want to gauge their public speaking. Um, maybe you want to gauge their marketing or leadership. Um, just try to find that sort of niche that um, you're very strong in and then try to basically exemplify that and basically show that to your um, audience that you hopefully have in your workshop. Um, next um, up is uh, the A, which is audience, and that is to identify your audience. Um, when you're having that workshop, you want to be able to gauge, like, what kind of group do you want to target? Um, while you may have a certain uh, niche topic that also requires a certain um, type of focus on what kind of audience and what kind of people you want to attract to your workshop. So let's say um, if you majored in business or are majoring in business um, and you want to be able to gauge future business leaders, leadership skills or marketing and how to be able to um, sell themselves to um, other businesses or maybe even work on their LinkedIn and professionalism, um, you need to be able to cultivate that sort of uh, work environment that you will be presenting to them so that that way that audience that you're trying to attract or maybe if you're trying to attract a new audience whether let's say maybe a wider range of multiracial or maybe specifically Vietnamese college students that you're able to find that reasoning and be able to um, cultivate your workshop around that. Oh, we skipped the P. Um, yeah, the last part, the P was possibility, and that is to identify learning possibilities. So <clears throat> while you're trying to cultivate your workshop and you fi find that sort of target audience, you want to be able to question again, like, what can you teach your target audience and what they don't already know? Now, um, let's say if you host something about um, marketing or let's say about leadership, um, some of your audience members who take your workshop may know the basic foundations of what makes a leader or how to be able to like market their organization or what it takes to integrate um, their community. But if you can take it to the next step um, that they um, not only like introduce people to that outlet, but also grow upon it, like say breaking Asian American stereotypes um, due to your specific knowledge, whether it be in classes or your um, activism that you've done in the past, um, can go one step further. Um, and even then, such as things like photography 101 and beauty storytelling, 
be able to be personal and to be able to be sort of like that assistance and um, from the building blocks of your workshop from their general knowledge and expanding upon that with them. So. And then briefly going back to this previous slide, um, this is a theory blooms taxonomy, um, but in a, a theory of learning, uh, people uh, had to kind of go linearly, like upwards towards this, um, this uh, way of learning. And so for the folks who have been to like multiple workshops, you may come to a point where like some information is too hard to comprehend or it's too easy. It's because that we're on different, uh, different levels of learning. And so this, this theory really helps you um, think about where students are at in their learning. If someone is learning race and um, photography for, for the first time, you wanna make sure that your content revolves around like these uh, explaining ideas and dropping and talking about facts. However, if this is like an advanced photography class, for example, um, you want to also name that and also um, create contact, content and activities that revolve around like producing new work or like talk about like evaluating and judging other people's um, like work. And so this is kind of a theory that we recommend to have you think about when you're thinking about the audience because the audience is also um, at different learning levels. So back to you, Intel. Yeah, and as um, what was said previously from strength, audience, and possibilities, we want to take that all together and um, gauge everybody's different learning potentials and learning levels. Um, so that way, um, whenever you are thinking about cultivating uh, a workshop centered around whatever target audience you have, just remember strength uh, that you have the audio, you will have the possibilities of the outcomes you want for your workshop. So, SAP. And on to Paler for examples. So, thanks, Atel. Um, so, um, due to the sake of time, we're going to be trying to do very brief examples um, just to help people digest kind of exactly this process. And so, for me, uh, in this particular example, I'm going to just use myself. Um, and so, editing identifying my strengths. Uh, this is an important time to just like think about like things that I've been um, doing um, that I want to incorporate inside of the VSA community and what I think I think would be important to learn. So I would say I'm pretty savvy in like social justice, like civic engagement, like storytelling. Um, I, I graduated with a healthcare degree and now in Washington doing nonprofit work. Um, and so this is just a list of like random examples. Uh, when it comes to VSA uh, and being a part of it for several years, uh, for me, I think I always want to cur curate towards folks who are similar like me. So like Vietnamese American students who are cu curious of their racial ethnic identity. For me, I grew up in a predominantly white uh, school and like society. And so growing up, I was excluded and faced a lot of discrimination. So I know there's such a a powerful experience when you can go into a workshop and they like talk to you specifically about some of these experiences being a, a part of a marginalized community and growing up as a Vietnamese. So um, I chose that. I'm going to choose that audience for this particular example. Um, in regards to the possibility, so to really make sure that the audience is engaged, like many of you have um, have asked, it's about being able to think about who exactly you're targeting and then figure out the gap in between. So like they're constantly seeking information and engaged. Um, oftentimes in uh, workshops, folks can be bored or uh, completely just like oblivious of the information that you're talking about, which causes disengagement. And so that's why it's important to identify this learning possibility. And so uh, in regards to um, what I have reflected upon, um, I see the opportunity in learning more Vietnamese history. Um, I know for me, I barely learned any through just like public education and in college, um, going to a quite diverse college. Um, I think storytelling and like advocacy, food and cooking, and, and just like uh, that aspect is also something that can be learned more. 
Um, and I think also when I think about learning history um, and some of these, there's also challenges in like stereotyping and shaming in our culture that um, I also am curious of trying to talk more about. And so then um, going through that process and then reflecting and kind of distilling that into one main like topic, um, I ended up coming with this sort of topic that we're going to be calling Vietnamese history and racial ethnic identity development. Um, and so uh, we're going to try to remember that. Uh, if someone could type that into the notes so people can remember, because we're going to go back to this and creating an actual workshop in a second. And so before I jump into the next phase, which is growing our roots um, and really hashing out learning outcomes, does anyone have any questions? Cool. And so, and so um, as you can tell, we're kind of doing, we're doing a metaphor through planting and growing a tree. And so um, this is also a strategy to help folks remember being able to take real life examples and or daily activities or daily materials or nature and incorporate it into our learning. And so um, again, um, going back, we we're planting seeds and now we're going to grow our roots. So learning outcomes, like what are they? Um, and so if you haven't heard of them, they're kind of what um, you're supposed to be doing or being able to achieve on completion of your workshop. Um, they, if you haven't, um, if you haven't created a workshop yet, um, they are very strategic. And so a reason why a workshop is engaging is because it's set up to do so. Um, a reason a, uh, a viral video or things in politics have happened in the professional realm that I've seen, that happens for a re reason. Like, People set this up strategically to make sure like this, these things happen. And so uh, we're hoping to teach you that. Um, and then these learning outcomes are also behavioral, intellectual, and emotional outcomes. Um, we don't just learn through like reading and consuming knowledge, but we also feel. For me, um, a philosophy of mine is I think feeling is a way of knowing. Um, I think we live in a society that caters towards knowing a lot more, but I think there's a lot of power in feeling and being able to empathize and understand people as well. And so with that, we came up with um, another analogy. Uh, actually, we didn't come up with that. These are all like rooted in theory, <laughs> but it's uh, affective, behavioral, and cognitive. So these are the three words that you should try to remember when thinking about how to develop learning outcomes. And so the first one is effective. So these are revolving around um, these feelings and values that you want your participants to, uh, to leave with. So in general, you want them to all be very positive. Um, some examples are like empowered. You want them to feel excited, confident, activated. Um, there's also the value part. Sometimes I know for me, uh, in my previous workshops, I really want to heavily value or have folks value themselves and their ethnic identity. And um, especially being like an organization or a conference revolved around the identity. Um, there's a reason why it's called Vietnamese Student Association, right? And so um, with that, I also try to get them to feel all these emotions and try to have them actually um, be inspired to uh, be engaged with the community. And so, again, those are some examples. B is behavioral. Um, your workshop can be focused on specific skills um, or specific things to demonstrate at the end of it. So examples are public speaking, being able to use Excel better, photography, dancing, being able to do a, a good one-on-one -on -one conflict re resolution, uh, singing, et cetera. Um, and so these are, uh, this is more common, um, including the third one, which is cognitive learning outcome. Uh, these two, I would say knowledge and like behavior or being able to demonstrate something or being able to know something are like the main things people focus on and they forget about this feeling aspect. But again, um, going back to cognitive learning outcomes, um, you can also be very 
intentional and strategic about what you want them to take away with. Like in this workshop, we already um, listed and talked about three different theories. The SAP theory that um, programming has just made, <laughs> the ABC theory, um, and also the Bloom's uh, taxonomy learning hierarchy. Um, so those are three things that we also are, are like, that is an example of specific things we want you to leave remembering. Um, you can also incorporate again stories, data, and reports. And so going back to the topic that um, I've created, um, again, it's going to revolve around Vietnamese history and racial ethnic identity development. And so starting with um, the, the effective, um, which revolves around this feeling and value, um, we're going to um, we're going to list out a few things that I'd want people to really take out of it. And then one key thing to remember is that um, all of these can intersect with each other, um, meaning sometimes like when you know something, you then can also feel. For example, um, you can know that you're not alone through having a facilitated dialogue about uh, about growing up as a Vietnamese American or Asian American or as a female, etc. cetera. Uh, but these examples are um, going back to the value and feel, uh, three examples. One example is to value their ethnic identity and connection to the collective history. Um, this is specifically towards Vietnamese history. Um, I want them to also feel empowered to learn and confident in talking about history, race and identity and then also to feel accepting and unapologetic of themselves. Um, and so it's important to hash these out because again, this is going to eventually link up to our activities and the strategies and how we present. So please bear with me if it does not make, uh, it doesn't go full circle yet. I also want audience to be able to share their own story. Um, growing up marginalized in whatever identity that they have. I want them to be able to storytell, to combat stereotypes, because we've all, most of us have been stereotyped before and it's not a good feeling. And then also be able to talk more about Vietnamese history. In regards to the cognitive learning outcome, I want students to know um, three essential historical Vietnamese events that inform who we are today. I want them to know more about themselves and the complexity of race and ethnicity. And then I also want them to be able to know and name different social identities. And then this topic around power, privilege, and intersectionality. And so, um, so going back to that um, intersectional kind of like overlapping of uh, learning outcomes, you can see that I have one to know three essential historical Vietnamese events. And then also to teach brief Vietnamese history kind of overlaps. So again, I wanted to make sure that um, this is not like the the set in stone type of way of of uh, creating these learning outcomes. But we're gonna set those there for now. And so after you create those those learning outcomes, you then can start to conceptualize what exactly. Um, you want to be talking about in regards to your main like agenda and similar to like any kind of workshop there's like the introduction uh, there's like bodies or your kind of main concepts um, and then there's your conclusion and so we're going to first uh, to save time um, we're going to pretend I spent like 30 minutes reflecting upon this and then kind of uh, distilling these all these outcomes or these learning outcomes into these one, two, these four topics. And so I came up with power and privilege and intersectionality. Um, the next topic was um, a talking about Vietnamese and Southeast Asian immigration history. Um, the third topic is talking more about ethnic identity, what it means to be Viet. And then the last one is um, talking about combating stereotypes and effective storytelling. And so to give you kind of more visual of how this all connects, we go to this slide. You could see, um, hopefully, um, if you're, if you're, you have hard trouble seeing color, please uh, let us know. But um, if you can 
C color, you can see that a lot of these different um, topics in the agenda overlap with a lot of the different learning outcomes, which is very important. Um, this is why, um, this is how we can be more intentional with achieving these outcomes. And so when you think about creating a workshop, I don't know how often you think about like after you present it or after um, you do something like, oh, like did this actually make an impact? Um, if you can go back and you can think about uh, if you can write down these learning outcomes and put it into your agenda, then there's a good chance that you've been reaching um, and creating an impact. And so, again, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's learning outcomes and being able to distill into um, an agenda or like a very skeleton um, template of your, your workshop. Um, before we move into creating more engaging content for your workshop, does anyone have any questions on that part of learning outcomes? So, okay. So we're going to move on to engaging content. So now we're going to be forming the trunk because the tree has a trunk and that's important. And so um, moving on to the next slide, I think when being a very engaging presenter, people don't clearly understand the different roles of presenter or a person who does a workshop um, because there's many ways of doing a different workshop or d doing a workshop and being in different roles. Um, and I think people are unclear of that. So for this next slide, we're going to break down different type of workshop people or individuals and roles you can take. Um, the four is trainer, uh, facilitator, presenter, and mentor. Um, when it comes to a trainer, these individuals are typically those who provide like more heavy knowledge um, that helps retain knowledge um, and enhance performance. And so these, spe these specific type of workshops are more for like experts or inter um, uh, intermediate kind of um, audiences that already have a good grasp of the topic. And now they have someone who is a high level expert who can really um, enhance like their performance, whether that's again, like photography or dancing. Uh, when it comes to a facilitator, um, these are people uh, and also these are processes that have folks within the, the workshop really build knowledge based on each other. Um, when a individual doing a workshop or kind of presenting um, as a facilitator, they're not necessarily like telling people knowledge. They're kind of helping um, direct conversations. And so, for example, um, to inside a workshop talking about Asian American um, identity, there's oftentimes uh, small groups where people will group up into like two to four group or two to four individuals, and then they come together and talk about what it means to be like Asian American. Um, that is that is an example of what it means to be like um, to facilitate a spe uh, specific activity. Uh, the next one's presenter. So this is particularly different uh, because this is an individual or a process in which someone shows or explains information within a very designated amount of time. And so sometimes I think people overuse or like take on the role of presenter too much and all they do during their workshop is talking and not allowing the audience to like engage with each other and be able to build upon like already existing knowledge base. Um, the easiest thing uh, example is like a professor, professor or some type of teacher who is doing a lecture. Um, however, this is also um, important because most workshops have a part where they talk specifically or lecture specifically about some type of information. Um, mentor, this role and this process is specifically um, someone who works very closely to 
target and enhance a specific technical skill. Um, so um, this is really like very curated type of like um, learning. So inside a workshop where if you're um, writing, let's say you're writing a poetry, the individual would come around and you would talk, or the presenter would come around, talk to the audience about their particular work and help them curate it into a certain way or like learn. And so when you look at all these roles and all these ways of, um, of presenting, um, there's a lot of different ways of sharing information. Um, there's written, spoken, there's verbal and nonverbal, there's movement and stationary. Um, and these are a list of examples that you can go. Uh, this is not, uh, but it's not an exhaustive list. And just to name some, just in case you can't see, um, you can use handout reports. You can, again, incorporate dance, you incorporate videos, photos, skits, demonstrations, etc. And these are all different ways to ensure that your, um, your audience is engaged. And they all have different type of benefits um, and also disadvantages. And so when you think in any workshop, I think one of the key tools or skills to make sure it's engaging is being able to tell a good story and being able to make sure it's um, digestible. Uh, storytelling for me is the opportunity to connect and have people empathize and really understand like information and who people are. And so um, with that, I'm going to, we're going to share a one, one brief tool or kind of um, process that helps you build more effect or tell more effective stories. And so um, we're going to put this into a binary. Um, there's going to be public and then private stories. So we're going to start with private, also ones that you don't want to. Um, they share information, but they make people feel negative and disengaged. Um, and the key thing, the reason why these are ones that you don't want is because usually a workshop is supposed to be activating. It's supposed to be inspiring. It's supposed to really erupt and provoke um, action. And, um, and so um, example is um, one that I, uh, it's more of a, yeah, this is definitely, this is a real life example for me. Um, when I was in college, during my first year of college, um, I came into college, especially as a first generation college student, um, feeling like I was on top of the world. And so I tried to do everything and try to do student group activities. I tried to sleep. I tried to take like 18 credits and especially in STEM when I was pre-med. And then at, during my finals, my first year, um, my grandma had a hemorrhage stroke and I went to the hospital and basically saw her like just hopeless and um, it caused a lot of pain, but then it, uh, but then eventually led me to start working hard. And so that's me giving an example of a private story. And so we're going to switch it up and I'm going to tell the same story, but make it public. And so th these are specifically important to help feel, help, help the audience really feel empowered and really provoked to take action, um, to go and to, um, to do something or like, yeah, again, like take action. And these specifically include a lot more emotion and a like call to action. And so again, um, back in college, um, I felt like I was on top of the world. Um, I came in as a first year college student, um, really to try to take advantage of everything. Um, I tried to do student group activities. I tried to take, uh, get sleep and take like 18 credits, especially being on pre-med. Um, but then I, one day I got in call um, during my finals, my mom called and she said, um, your my why or your grandma is like in the hospital. And from that, I 
immediately rushed to the hospital and I got to the hospital bed or the room and I saw my grandma just uh, frantically trying to get help and, and no one could help her. And what I saw was incompetent and um, uncultured like providers being a, not being able to support my, my grandma who was completely helpless. And from that, I, although it was really hard to see her in pain, it was really mod- it caused me to change the directory of my, uh, my studies. Instead of going pre-med, I switched to healthcare management because I realized like I can't wait and I don't want to wait to see people I care about to go into the hospital and to be hurt. I want to change the whole healthcare system so that when folks do get harmed, they can get supported with a lot of cultural competence. competence. They can have people who can actually translate and be able to um, and be cared for. Um, eventually, this led me into other community work um, and also, again, like changing my major. So, um, yeah, those are like, that's an example of me kind of changing these narratives. Um, although it's kind of small uh, and it kind of sounds similar, these stories, uh, imagine if you tell like, you constantly tell like, like stories for every single slide, it does add up and it does eventually cause people to either be engaged or be disengaged. And also allows you to connect further with people. And so um, now we're gonna go back to um, the topic and do an example of how um, we're going to create engaging content. And so again, pulling up the slide with our agenda and our learning outcomes, we're gonna see we have four main bodies. We have a red one, a brownish orange one, we have a green one and then a blue one. And so um, to save time again, uh, I'm going to, we're going to pretend that I've reflected about this for some time and have decided on what particular activity to do. If you go, um, activity or um, strategy that I'm going to use to transfer this knowledge. And so for the first main body, it's power, privilege, and intersectionality. Uh, for me, I, uh, I'm imagining this being a PowerPoint lecture that specifically defines these, these terms um, and being able to further enhance like the audience knowledge. I think everyone understands power privilege. Um, they understand race. There's a lot, there's a lot of buzzwords that are thrown out all the time. And, but I don't think people truly understand what it means and what it actually, and how it's actually practiced. Um, and so that's why I'm going to do a PowerPoint lecture on that. The second one is the history or the Viet and Southeast Asian immigration timeline. Um, this one, I'm going to take the role of a presenter uh, because I'm basically going to lecture um, information about specific moments in Vietnamese and Southeast Asian immigration. Uh, this is not training because um, I'm strictly giving information. Uh, I'm not really helping like enhance anyone's like uh, their skills. And so the third one is the body where we talk about what it means to be Viet. So this one is the one where um, I want to be a presenter slash facilitator. Um, this is um, going to be facilitated in a way where I go and I divide folks into different groups and allow them to talk to each other about what it means to be Vietnamese. And so this is a strategic way to um, increase the amount of like contacts because instead of me just talking to everyone, um, they can talk to each other. So everyone has like a more engaging time to connect. And then um, for my last topic, combating stereotypes and effective storytelling, um, I'm going to take on, again, a facilitator role and a mentor role, um, being able to um, do an activity where we perform real life scenarios. So an example or the way I would do this that we thought about um, 
is being able to put people into groups of like three or four and tell them to perform a real life scenario and then going um, as they're practicing for like the however minutes that we've assigned going around and talking specifically about those real life scenarios and these scenarios i would assume would be revolving around experiences of discrimination um and um being able to being able to um to react or create a scene where they face the stereotype and then they're able to um, deconstruct it or address it on the spot And so uh, this leads us to our second to last phase, which revolves around accessibility. And um, before I get going with this one, does anyone have any questions? Cool, if no one has any questions, we'll continue. Again, going back to the tree metaphor, we're now going to be extending our branches so that we can further enhance the engagement of our, um, of our workshop and allow it to uh, be seen and, in, and comprehended. And so why do we need accessibility? Um, accessibility is tied into kind of uh, the dimensions of, our, of who we are. So we're physical, we're emotional, social, economical, and intellectual human creatures. And it's, uh, there is access or there's um, opportunities where something can be accessible, meaning it could be used by someone or something can be completely inaccessible um, and someone cannot engage and they cannot learn. And so when it comes to inaccessibility or accessibility, when it comes to the physical dimension, um, most of us, I would say, are not colorblind. Most of us have good eyesight. Um, most of us have our hearing. And so when you are in, or when you're creating a workshop, like you think about your audience, you have to make sure that it's inclusive of everyone. Um, I would say, especially like VSA conferences, overall it's like very privileged as in, it's college students um, who can afford to go, um, who have the economic ability. Um, there's people who are able to also like move around. Um, not at times you find someone with a physical disability or even like mental like disability, which is included in that. Um, when it comes to emotions, um, workshops can be, depending on the topic, it can be triggering or emotionally like disengaging. Um, when doing specific workshops on um, like mental health or any stigmas or things that may be triggering, um, it's, it's important to be able to use language that is not causing that. So it's important to also remember those emotions. Um, social um, language, um, I assume folks probably didn't take a workshop at BSA all in Spanish. Um, English may be not someone's first language. Um, it's also important to make sure that you shouldn't use like jargon. You try to minimize jargon, which is just like buzzwords and such. This intersects also with intellectual, the, the intellectual um, dimension. Um, and then um, shared conversations as well. If you just have a workshop that has large group conversations. Most of the time, only the extroverts or folks who are very comfortable talking in big spaces um, will talk. And so maybe because you know that, you might want to consider doing more, more small group conversations. And economical, most of the time, if people are at a conference, they already can access it. But um, it's also like thinking about this workshop, like this workshop is free, you need a laptop, although it's kind of well into economics, like. It's more accessible than driving like 10 hours to Michigan from like Minnesota and doing and going to the conference. Uh, and again, intellectual, just being aware of your jargon and people's like experiences like and such. The next part is um, like, how do you best create accessibility? Because again, we're trying to make sure your workshop is 
highly engaging. Um, and it's interesting. It's keeping people on their toes and they're learning and they're having fun. So it's being able to think about some of these like dimensions and figure out how to make sure all your activities and content is accessible, making sure the font is big enough, making sure um, color contrast is is accessible, accessible. Um, and then also sometimes, or as you may notice, people always ask for like accommodations. Like for this workshop, we didn't because we didn't have the capability, but usually it's important to ask if anyone needs any accommodations um, to support them and the other strategies. And so um, going back to my example of kind of making sure your, um, your PowerPoints or your videos, your content, everything is accessible by like text and color contrast. There's actually a standard that shows um, a, a formal standard that helps you determine whether like the color on your PowerPoint like is accessible. And so then use like general like population like standards like biological standards as well. Uh, this is called Web AIM or Web Accessibility in Mind. Uh, this is a website here. Um, if you haven't heard of it, uh, it can be a helpful tool. Um, but it's essentially, it measures like the contrast ratio for different texts and colors backgrounds, um, and then it tells you on a scale from A to AA to AAA whether it's accessible or not. And so this is um, a photo of the website. You can see. Right here on the left, um, it allows you to put in your six digit color code and then you can compare that to the background color and then gives you a contrast ratio and then down or give you a contrast ratio on the right and then down below, it'll tell you whether like your text size and the color, um, the text size works as well. This is the last phase. Um, us showing our leaves. Before we get started on this phase, does anyone have any questions? Right, cool. So um, the last part is the description and the title. Um, again, like if you haven't noticed, like similar to any type of like process or like strategic process you usually deconstruct every single piece and then you start backwards if you're trying to lose 10 pounds in a year you'd probably start by like hashing out like your whole year dividing each month by 10 pounds and be able to make sure that every month you're reaching a certain goal um, again um, the Description and the title should be the very last part because that's the outward facing. You want to start internally or metaphorically like in the roots or planting seeds and then eventually growing up the trunk and expanding out to branches and then to the leaves. So this should be the last part again. This should be the easiest part because you have everything figured out already. So when it comes to the description, um, you want to be explicitly explaining and expanding on your topic, your learning outcomes, your target audience, brief activities and strategies. How I ensure my workshops are engaging is to making sure the right people are in there. Um, and that means that my description and title shares exactly what I'm presenting on because I'm not trying to trick people into learning something they don't want to learn. I think often people do that just because they want numbers, but it's actually more impactful if you if you uh, tell people what you're actually going to share and effectively doing that. Uh, and so again, this includes the topic, the learning outcomes, the target audience, and then the brief, like briefly, like mentioning like maybe activities and strategies. Um, the title should be one sentence. Uh, I don't think I've ran across multiple sentence title. Um, but it should really briefly go over the topic and maybe a call to action. For me, I really like putting a call to action or an action inside my workshop because my workshop is meant to, usually my workshops are meant to teach people something and that it's important to learn so you can go do something. 
So that's a tip. Um, these are, again, not uh, constraint. Like you can expand on these, you can change them. But this, again, is like our strategy and creating an effective workshop. Other key things is the clearer the better, the less is better. Again, you don't want to over, um, oversaturate like, and dilute words. Um, and uh, make sure it's predictable. Make sure it can like catch speakers' interests. Um, make sure it's reflective of all these like topics that we just talked about, and then contain like keywords that like are relevant. So, with that, um, we are going to. Due to the sake of time, I'm going. We we're going to pretend I did all that, and I, I, gave. Uh, I made a sentence for each of these bullets for the description, and then I also created the title. Um, but um, this is the workshop that came from making all these uh, learning outcomes, thinking about the agenda, and then thinking about the, the topic as well. And so the title um, is Deconstructing Vietnam's Colonization to Combat Racial and Ethnic Stereotypes. Um, and then this is our workshop description. I'm not going to read it because it's kind of long. But usually I like to add um, a sentence about mainly the topic and then uh, which is examining Vietnamese history and colonization, hence or slash dominance. Um, and then adding a word about what exactly we're going to be doing, which is to combat this would be storytelling. Um, I also want to talk and tell st people that is going to be highly engaging by sharing stories because I'm going to be incorporating a lot of storytelling and small group activities. And then my target audience are individuals seeking to better understand their ethnic identity. Uh, and then usually at the end too, I, I just list my, I condense all of my learning outcomes into three brief ones. And I add a feeling, I add a knowledge or cognitive one, and then I also add a demonstration one. Just not to overwhelm everyone. Um, but again, this is not set in stone. Um, and you can do it like however you feel. But I feel, again, the more clear you are with these two things, um, with your audience, the more impactful it can be, especially um, if you're trying to be engaging, because engagement starts with the frontward facing kind of content. So with that, um, we go back to everything, and now everything is put together. We have the title on top, Deconstructing Vietnam's Colonization um, to Combat Racial and Ethnic Stereotypes. Uh, if you want to make it more specific, we can be like in the Midwest or in Minnesota. Again, another tip is to be more clear, um, which because you'll only have like 58 minutes or like 50 minutes to an hour and 50 minutes. Um, and then here's the description and the learning outcome. And then here's the agenda again. So. Again, um, that was um, that was a lot for just an hour. So I appreciate y'all for uh, for staying engaged, or hopefully you learned something. Uh, this is a very rundown process, or very not rundown, but very brief process of how um, to develop a workshop. Um, it's uh, it's definitely not linear, and so feel free to like jump around in different areas if you come up with a title or like a topic or you come up with some like takeaway you can do it that way as well but key things to remember like again if you have troubles um, and if you're creating a workshop um, think about these five different things and where to start like cultivating a topic um, cultivating a learning outcome engaging content think about accessibility making sure it's highly engageable and then making sure your outward facing content is um, is curated and very very relevant to what you're actually teaching. And if you forget, just remember the analogy and metaphor of the tree. But again, um, thank you for joining us. Um, I don't know if folks have questions, but um, if you also are part of uh, UVSA Midwest, our workshops are due Saturday, January 18th at 11.59 p.m. Central Time. You can contact any of the, the hosts here, Erica, Intel, or I. Um, but again, thanks for jumping on. Anyone have questions?
Yes, actually, is it possible if you're able to uh, email the PowerPoints? Um, so it's going to be recorded by Skipper. Uh, he's recording it right now, so I think it's going to be posted somewhere. I'm not exactly sure where, but uh, hopefully it will be released soon after. Oh, yes, on YouTube, on our YouTube. So... Cool. Uh, Antonio, we'll make sure that you can get the PowerPoint too. Any other questions, feedback, or advice? For me, I know I'm not the only one who has attended a workshop before or a good workshop. So if y'all also have any advice, um, we'd love to hear it as well. You're welcome, Danny. Well, if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, I I um, really enjoy being able to uh, like create these workshops, especially if it's revolving around like VDBs, like VSA community work. So, if you want to set up like a one-on-one -on -one or talk to programming about anything, or like you want to walk through this process and really like learn the process and like dive deep into it. I'm open to that as well. Again, our contact information is right there. Uh, but good luck. Um, hopefully bye. And um, change the world. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully you learn something new. All right. Does that mean everyone can leave now? Yeah. We should be good. Cool. Um, another thing is hopefully we plan on uh, continuing this sort of like training um, for workshop presenters. Um, so if you plan on being a workshop presenter, hopefully we will uh, be able to put more series of training and uh, information for uh, future workshop presenters. That's the plan. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you.